Welcome to Be Advised, Leading with Value with Brad Swinehart. In this podcast, we will focus on successful marketing methods for advisors that generate prospects and clients. We will learn from the best in the industry on how advisors in the trenches today are growing their practices. Join us for this journey where Brad draws from years of expertise and guest experts to help advisors reach their full potential. Brad Swinehart of White Glove is here with the latest in his podcast series, Be Advised, Leading with Value. Brad's guest this episode is Daniel Collison, Managing Partner with Advice to Advisors, a training and coaching firm for financial advisors. Dan, super happy to have you on the show today. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I want to just be here, get Brad. Right. Thanks very much. Yes, we've, we've done a lot of fun things together, so I'm sure this will be equally as entertaining and educational. And no doubt one about thing it. That, one thing that I'm seeing, Dan, and I really want to get your take on this, is we talk to just hundreds, if not thousands of advisors, and, and a common message that's coming back is just this, I don't know if fear is the right word, but it's this hesitance to move forward as an advisor in this uncertain times that we're in. Everything's sort of changing, and it's there's a lot of advisors that I'm talking to that are becoming stagnant because they're not sure where to go. And I know you work with some of the top advisors, both in the U.S. and Canada, and I wanted to get your take on that. Are you seeing the same thing? Yeah, absolutely the same thing, Brad. There there are those, and it's almost always the top performers that plow through no matter what it is. And, and certainly COVID is something totally unique to everybody on the scene today in that this wasn't a, an economically or financially driven situation. It's the health concern. That, and I think that's what's really made the big change. And this is what's disrupted advisors as well as everyone else so much as it's, it's brand new. We don't really know what to do, but the best of the best advisors just plow through. They tweak, they change. They, they're always looking for what they have to do better. And it's no different during COVID right now. They're doing the same thing. They just, they just keep moving forward and, and looking for what they have to tweak because the new normal is exactly that. The, the old normal is gone. It won't be coming back in my estimation. Everything that's virtual I think a huge percentage of what's virtual will remain virtual. It'll be added to what we used to do live, you know, advisors seeing clients. I think that will be on the decline on a face-to-face basis. They will be using virtual meetings so much more, just as in our training and our coaching has gone 100% virtual. So we've made that, that switch, that pivot, as they say. But that is the new normal, and I think it's going to remain there. But we've got to adapt this was coming no matter what. The virtual life was coming. COVID just pushed it up by years, I would think, but there's no going back to the way we were. That's really interesting because a few years ago, it was, there was this big fear in the industry about the robo-advisor taking over and people not not needing face-to-face with advisors anymore because they could just go get an app or they could hop on and get some AI help instead. And this pandemic, this new environment that we're in, really pushed forward and and showed the weakness there, that you can't get that type of information from a robot. You can't get that from an app or a a site that you still need human interaction. And the advisors that we're seeing really latch on to that and and know that their community needs them. If they have that correct mindset, it's just an an opportunity now. And it really shows the flaws. Yeah, go ahead. I think what you said on information is critical there. The one thing top advisors understand and they're able to discern in this discern, and this is where robo advisors come into it. There's a difference between information, knowledge, and wisdom. Information is, is exactly that. It's information and you can get information on personal finances on the internet. Anybody can go and grab the information. It's out there. That's all well and good. And those are the individuals that that do tend to be the do-it-yourselfers. Knowledge, however, is how you take that information and apply it to your situation. And that's where advisors come in. They, They take the knowledge. But individuals, if they put enough studying, if they're really willing to commit themselves, they can still do that on their own. But the best of the best advisors understand you have to go to the level of wisdom. And that really is knowledge compounded 
by time and use and expertise. And it's that expertise that the top financial advisors use to their benefit over, first of all, other advisors, and secondly, over robo-advisors. The reality is, at a level of wisdom, you're, you are considered the expert in what you do. And you really can tell that difference when people are asking your opinion. It's no longer they're just asking for facts. That's just the information, the facts. They want to go beyond the knowledge. You know, how do I apply this to my situation? But they want your opinion. They want to know, okay, we understand this, this bit of knowledge. This is how we should apply it. But does that make sense for us? Or should we be looking at other alternatives, other strategies, other products? And the best of the best advisors really go to that wisdom and they stick to it. And that's how they kill their competition. That's how they're going to kill the, the whole idea of the internet taking over, of robo-advisors usurping live advisors. Uh, they don't worry about, about technology. They use technology to their benefit just to, to back up their wisdom. And that's the reality. And, and they're doing it now and they're doing it better than ever during COVID. Well, that's interesting. Let's talk a little bit about that. So the, the top advisors you're saying are, are adapting to this and they're using that technology. How does that affect the standard business structure. How are top advisors now structuring their business? It used to be you do a live seminar, you meet that person back in your office, you had that that professional greet them in the lobby, maybe you had a video playing, there was the whole setup during that first meeting where you set out the drink that they wanted, like there's a whole production to it and people would have that dialed in. How do you yeah. change your business structure now that everything is pushing the virtual? What are the top advisors that you're working with seeing success with with a new structure. Yeah, and, and Brad, you're, you're absolutely right. They're, they're, they're working within the structure they had built, but they've got to tweak it. So most top advisors are great on gaining referrals. Now, the, one, the one thing we do know, Brad, is that most advisors actually don't ask for referrals, despite the fact that they've been trained to. And what the research says is exactly that, that you shouldn't ask for referrals because it actually makes your clients uncomfortable. You, however, have to be absolutely referable, and that's gonna support not just the referrals themselves, but everything else you do from a marketing and a prospect, prospecting basis. However, during this time of COVID, what we found is since you can't be face-to-face, -face, that, that actually changes the likability, the trustworthiness, those, some of those aspects of, of becoming referable that you can do much easier face-to-face -face than, than doing over, over a webinar and such. Uh, so what we're seeing with advisors, they're upping their communications with their clients. They're upping them both on the technical side. So they're keeping their clients informed on what's going on, but they're adding some more personal contact. There's a great advisor that I've known for, for almost three decades, Mario. I, I actually wrote on LinkedIn about this just the other day. He, he goes by and swears by a communication process he uses 10 by 10. In other words, by 10 a.m., he's contacted 10 of his top clients every single day of the week. And, and that means that from a Monday to a Friday, he's connected. And he doesn't even necessarily want to talk to them face-to-face -face over the phone, as it were. But he wants voicemail, at least. But he just wants to say, hi, thinking about you. If you've got any concerns, give me a call. So he's contacted his top 50 clients each week. He's got his assistants doing his next levels down that they're contacting. So he's really up the ante on his communications. And that truly does help build that referability because it, it builds more trustworthiness within the referability. So more communications versus less. And sadly, I just saw a study the other day that said upwards of 26% of all clients have not been contacted by their advisors during COVID. And that is unbelievable to me. That tells me we've either got advisors under their desks in the fetal position, or they're just trying to get rid of some of their clients and they're not contacting them, which I don't think is a good way to remove those clients. But excess communication, more communication is better than this, the norm. On the targeted introductions, you've got to be very precise on who you want to be introduced to. And now it's going to be virtual. And just asking your clients, you know, 
you know, Brad, if, if I want to meet Patrice, I know you know Patrice, and I say, Brad, I'd like you to introduce me to Patrice just in case she ever needs any help with her investments or in your insurance or, or her tax planning. How, how can we meet today, Brad? Should, should we do it over LinkedIn? Should we do it over Facebook? Should we have a, a phone call or maybe a Zoom call? How, how would you suggest, Brad? So you got to take it to the next level with the virtual introductions. The personal networking groups that top advisors build, they haven't changed. And in fact, with our coaching clients, the advisors that hadn't already set up their personal networking groups, we had them all summer long, putting a lot of effort into building a group and a network of professionals that also focus on the same ideal client profile that the advisor does. And they're just running these groups. And the whole idea of the networking group is that you're cross-pollinating your client bases with your attorneys, your accountants, you know, maybe IT specialists, everybody that's focused on the same type of client, you're there to help refer and introduce to each other's clients. So that's continuing, but it's on a virtual platform now. And then where a lot of top advisors do seminars, that face-to-face getting out in front of the public where they become the experts, they had to do that real quick pivot to webinars. And most of them did that seamlessly, which is fabulous. But what we're suggesting to our coaching clients is you've got three three distinct areas you can go to when it comes to webinars. You can do your clients and their guests. So you should be doing that regularly. It costs you virtually nothing. The beauty of webinars is they don't know how many people are on with them. When you think about a a seminar, if if you put out 50 seats and only 10 people show up, (laughs) that really shows negatively. However, with a webinar, you know, nobody knows how many are, and you can just talk to the webinar as though you've got a room full of 100 attendees. So that works really well. So doing it with clients allows you to practice and get better at your craft of doing webinars. Going into companies or associations that, that are linked to your ideal client profile is another great method, or then going and doing public seminars, which I'm a big fan of because you want to get your reach out beyond your natural circle of influence, getting out to do them. You can do that marketing on your own, which I I highly recommend not doing because it eats up all your time. And most advisors aren't experts on doing that. You can use firms such as White Glove where they do all the marketing and you just be the star on the webinar. And that's what we're seeing. The top advisors have moved almost, almost seamlessly from seminars to webinars and they're getting their reach out to both their clients as well as to the bigger public. Wow, that's so much gold there, Dan. I wanna back up just a minute here. And one of the things that you said was, you know, the advisor hiding under their desk. And I, and I, I want your take on this, but it's my impression that if you can be there right now for your client when they have questions, when they, are, when they might be worried, you have, you have one opportunity to wow your clients and that's to get information to them before they need to seek you and ask for it. And now if you can be that person, you can be that thought leader and reassure your clients, it seems like they will be endeared to you for the rest of their lives. And I just want your take on that. Yeah, so true, Brad. And in fact, if, if you took your client list and you want to check off or put an X Every time you call a client preemptively, so they haven't called you, you you call them, put a check mark. But every time you get a call from a client that you hadn't already called, put an X, because that means they were coming to you. And that is not a good thing. You need to be out in front of this whole situation. That gives confidence. One of the biggest things about being referable is giving clients hope. And the best of the best advisors are optimists. They're realistic optimists. They know history. They understand mankind's gone through a lot of things. And the reality is COVID, other than the economic destruction it's done, which, you know, that's done by the politics of of COVID. We've shut down the economies. Other than that, we've got to give our clients hope that they're going to come out of this all right and ultimately better than they were before. And if, if, Top advisors know anything, they know history. And this is a blip in history. It's a blip in time. We will get past this because by by no means is this the worst of anything that mankind's faced. In fact, 
It's not the worst pandemic that humankind has faced. So we've got to give them hope. And you need to be on the phone. You need to be on Zoom or whatever platform you're using. You need to be getting to your clients before they get to you to give them that hope. So yeah, if they're calling you because you haven't contacted, that's a big X right there. But if you're reaching out, you're contacting and you're doing it multiple times, you know, and again, that if you take Mario's 10 by 10, so if I if I call 10 people by 10 a.m. five days a week, I'm going to take care of all my top clients within a week or two, and then I'm going to take care of the rest of them shortly thereafter. But you have to be pre preemptive. Communications is absolutely key to give your clients hope, to give them confidence in you, and ultimately in their own financial goals. Yeah, I recently read a statistic that said when someone leaves their financial advisor, 80% of those people list a poor communication as a as a reason of why they left. Yeah, so I heard you mention I heard you mention a few times Facebook or LinkedIn. Do you feel social media now is an appropriate way to stay relevant or stay in front of your clients or prospects? What are you seeing there when it comes to that trend? Absolutely. Absolutely. And unfortunately, you know, you look at the demographics of financial advisors and it very much mirrors the general public in both the U.S. and Canada in, in that we've got an aging population of advisors. And the downside of that, if you're not on social media or you weren't on it pre-COVID, you've had to play catch up. But definitely you want to use that. And, and to me, that's a backstop. It, it, it allows me to be out there publicly for my clients and, and potentially for prospects, but they get to see me, they get to see my name, they get to see information I put out there as an advisor, and that's fantastic. However, you still have to then go beyond that with the personal touch, the, the phone call, the, the personal virtual contact as well. But having that social media presence so that they're always seeing you, again, we see experts on TV, we see experts on social media. That's where the advisor has to be. That's, that's kind of ground stakes now. If, if you're not there, uh, you've, really, you've really missed the ship on that one. Doesn't mean you can't recoup, but it, it just makes your life that much easier. And the more you can get somebody to take that off your plate so that it's running on autopilot, you know, obviously you've got say in it, but Man, it, it can take up a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of thought process to market yourself on all of these different platforms. So I, I always suggest to our clients, find a service, get them to take care of that. Because again, that's ground stakes. That's basic stuff now that you must have. And then you've got to be in the trenches making those phone calls, doing those Zoom meetings and such. Yeah. And that's what I'm seeing too. The, the advisors working with White Glove that are top advisors that are really adapting and seeing real success, they've all optimized social media in some fashion, whether it's through our program, you know, that uh, our social connect program mm -hmm. or, or something else. But, but it's, you, it, I think it's more important now than ever to stay in front of your clients. And it's surprising how many of your clients are on social media on a regular basis. So well, we talked yeah, about you're right there, Brad. And that's, so you got to look at social media from very much like sports. You've got an offense and you've got a defense. And when I'm talking table stakes, you know, from a social media perspective, I've got to be there just so my clients see me. Because if they don't see me, they're seeing other advisors. If they're getting information from other advisors, and if that information is translating to knowledge or ultimately wisdom, I'm going to be pushed out. I'm going to be wedged out of that relationship at some point in time. So that is table stakes from a defensive point of view. From an offensive point of view, I want to use social media, not just to reach out to my clients, but I'm going hunting. I'm prospecting. I want to be out there to look for new clients. I got to get beyond my natural reach. And social media is great for that. It's, it's going to give me the introductions beyond what I naturally could get to. Uh, so I've got to go from a, both a defensive and an offensive approach with social media, much like everything that we have to do as, as financial advisors, I've got to be out there working it. But, you know, most advisors are not their own marketing departments. And if they are, in fact, they tend to be substandard. 
So the more you can farm that out to professional marketing firms, you know, White Club being one of the best, always the better, right? Financial advisors should be doing what they need to be doing, which is, is advising clients, but the marketing has to get them those prospects and they have to constantly re-engage with their clients and that social media will certainly help with that. Dan, this has been great. I mean, we've really transitioned. We talked about the advisor that's fearful hiding under his desk or the advisor that's just putting his head down, hoping this thing will blow over and, and remaining stagnant and being complacent with that. And like you said, you know, if, if really 20% of clients are not hearing from their advisors, even stagnant is losing ground. So we talked about that and that, that positive mindset and having that plow through mentality, we, how you change the business structure to accommodate that. And then really the, the marketing and, and prospecting. Now we've tr transitioned from a advisor that's hiding under the desk to you've already now established, okay, how do you get more clients? What is the opportunity? And that's, let's, let's just wrap up on that, Dan. What would your, what would your take be on the opportunity that is out there today for financial advisors when it comes to marketing, when it comes to prospecting in this environment? Yeah, it's, it's very simple, Brad. If you're not out prospecting today, expect to die tomorrow. That's just the reality because those that are out hunting now, those that are prospecting, and I got to tell you, the best of the best, it's not that they're not fearful at times. It's just that they take that fear and they use the energy of the fear to overcome the fear itself by getting out and doing things. Sometimes it doesn't always work, but one thing about top advisors, they're always in motion. They're always moving. They're always looking for the next best thing and they're working it effectively, ultimately. So if you're not out prospecting today, your business is not only going to become stagnant, as you said, but the moment it becomes stagnant, it's a very short shelf life for stagnancy. It certainly turns downward quickly thereafter and you start to die in the business. So this is no time to say, I'm going to regroup. I'm going to think about this. Now, get out from under the desk. And even if you're not under the desk, if you're not pounding the phone, if you're not on virtual meetings, if you're not doing webinars, you're behind the eight ball because other advisors are doing it and they're eating your lunch and they're looking for your best clients and they will get some of them if you're not out there, both defensively and offensively. You got to be out there. That's wonderful. Dan, thank you very much for being on today. I think there's a ton of knowledge that you just shared with all of us, and I really appreciate that. I think the, the overarching or message that you just conveyed is that that being in motion or, or just trying to cover all your bases, research, regroup, all of that, there's a total difference between that and actually taking action. And I think that the message is if you want to be in a top advisor, if you are a top advisor and you want to remain a top advisor, that now is the time to take action and not sit back, not rest um, on what you've already accomplished because that's when you die. But Dan, Absolutely. thank you very much for being on the show today. It's yeah, always, always great catching pleasure, up with Brad. you. I'm All right. Definitely a ton of great actionable advice for advisors in this time of COVID, guys. Thank you so much. Brad Swinehart of White Glove and Daniel Collison, Managing Partner of Advice to Advisors. To subscribe to this podcast, Brad's podcast, Be Advised, Leading with Value, and get word of new episodes, use the subscribe button on this page. To share with friends and colleagues, use the share button. I'm Patrice Sikora, and let's talk again later. Thank you for listening to Be Advised, Leading with Value with Brad Swinehart. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Mike Love. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service providers with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.